Good evening. Hi. How's everybody doing today? Good. Excellent. Um, I, I, first, I'm going to tell you who I am because somebody asked me who I was. I guess I never introduced myself, even though I've been introducing speakers all year. My name is John Mulcahy, and I'm a staff astronomer at Carnegie, and I organize the series. So that's why I usually come up here and uh, tell you about your speakers. So, <laughs> so, so, so now you know. Um, that's the good news. Now here's the bad news. This is the last lecture we're going to be having in this room. After 10 years and uh, 10 years of many successful, but it's not because we the s lectures have not been successful. It's because the Huntington is tearing down this building to build a new auditorium. Yeah, so that's happening in the fall. We just learned about this. So what are we going to do? We're going to try to hold the lectures somewhere else. So, uh, but for many of you, I know many of you are Huntington members, and that's how you found out about us. Uh, since the lectures will not be at the Huntington next spring, if you want to find out about the lectures, you need to be on the Carnegie mailing list. So if you're not on our mailing list, there's a form out there. Please just give us your name and address, and um, we'll send you the brochure next year wherever the series will be. I'm still working on that. Um, in addition, we have an open house in the fall, usually in September or October, where you can come and visit our facility up on Santa Barbara Street. It's up off Lake. And it's a really fun activity during the day on a Sunday. So uh, if you are not on the Carnegie mailing list, I'll emphasize again, please uh, uh, sign up on the way out if you could. Because we'd really like to see you next year wherever we end up. And hopefully we'll be back here in two years in a nice big auditorium. So that's the, that's the story there. And I want to thank the Huntington uh, you know, for hosting us all these years. It's been really, really great. So yeah. Excellent. And our volunteer, Wilson, who sets us up all the time, we should give him a hand. Thank, thank you as well. So, so as many of you know, if you came to the series uh, earlier, uh, talk number two in our uh, series this year, we heard the beginning of a story about galaxies. That was how galaxies, the birth of galaxies. I don't remember what Guillermo called his talkies out here somewhere. Oops. Uh, today we're going to finish the story with Rick Williams. Uh, Rick is a postdoc, uh, postdoc at Carnegie. This is actually his second postdoc. That means it's training one does beyond uh, the PhD on the way to a faculty position. And Rick is truly outstanding, one of the world's leaders in this area called galaxy evolution. That is the study of how galaxies change in time. And you're going to get to hear a lot about this today from uh, Rick's uh, talk. Uh, Rick got his PhD at Ohio State University. He then went to Leiden, which is probably the most, I'd, I'd say, one of the strongest departments in Europe for his postdoc before coming to Carnegie, and we've had the pleasure of having him for three years. So I think you're going to really enjoy part two of Galaxy Evolution. Rick Williams. Well, thank you all for coming. It's quite a pleasure to be here, and thanks especially to the Huntington and to Carnegie for all their work in setting up these lectures. So there's been this loop playing here for a while, these uh, series of galaxy images. These are selected from what's called the ARP Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. This was released by Harlan ARP, uh, sorry, not Harlan, um, Halton, yes, Halton ARP, in 1966. So the black and white images, these blurry ones, are actually the images that were taken at Palomar by ARP in the 60s. And the clearer color images, of course, are from the Hubble Space Telescope. So you can see there's an incredible amount of detail. They're quite spectacular. But I'm not just showing them because they're spectacular. Um, I'm also showing them because they're highly relevant to the topic of this presentation, which is the later years of galaxies. So what happens to galaxies in the later stages of their lives? And that brings us to the title slide, Bright Galaxies, Dark Universe, Part 2, Adulthood to Retirement. And although this is part two of, of the uh, two-part lecture, I've tried to make it fairly standalone for those who couldn't make it to the first one. So I'm going to briefly revisit some su subjects that were uh, previously introduced, but I won't dwell on them too much. So to start off, this is an assemblage of galaxies taken from the Galaxy Zoo project. Some of you might be familiar with this as an online campaign that allows people to classify galaxies themselves for scientific purposes. So there are actually two interesting things that stand out from this diagram. One is the incredible diversity of galaxy types in the universe. But paradoxically, the other is the incredible homogeneity of galaxy types in the universe. These are, they, they range uh, quite a bit in morphology. So you see some that are blobby looking, some that are these very intricate spirals. 
um, the Milky Way would be a spiral galaxy, something like in the upper right. Um, but interestingly, when you look at massive galaxies, that is galaxies that have a number of stars comparable or bigger than the Milky Way, you can pretty much classify the vast majority of them in one of these broad uh, categories, spirals or ellipticals. So the diversity of galaxy types tells us that there are, are, there's some variance in how they form, but the fact that they can still be, they still fall into these fairly similar categories tells us something about the underlying physics. They must all be forming through some uh, consistent methods. Now there are a lot of uh, parallels actually between galaxy formation and human formation, or if you want to use other terms, human development or anthropology. So for example, if you wanted to look at this uh, small person here, you could say what characteristics does he share with his parents? So in other words, what, um, what qualities are passed down from progenitor to, uh, to child? Also, knowing something about human development, you could say, what will this person look like in a few decades? <laughs> so you can look at the evolution of individuals over time. And finally, we use theoretical models in galaxy formation. And if you have a good enough theoretical model of how people develop, you could infer what this person would look like if you were alive today. <laughs> and to some people, this is not a hypothetical statement. Of course, this is one individual. This is one person, so we can't really learn much about the state of humankind from one person. It helps a lot more to go with collections of individuals like these attractive and intelligent people here. <laughs> so if you study enough people in a large enough group and compare those groups to, to groups that came before them, you can infer something about how human humankind is changing and evolving on average. So we do the same in galaxy formation. And in fact, galaxy, studies of galaxies and studies of people share a lot of the same terms. We talk about individuals and populations of individuals. We conduct surveys to study them, and we look for how they change in terms of their growth, how they evolve in other phys physical characteristics, and we use words like aging. So what happens to them as they get older? Anthropologists are pretty much stuck with the historical record. If you want to go really far back, you can only study things like art and artifacts, some of which may be more accurate than others. Literature, photographs, movies. You don't have a necessarily, necessarily a living record of the people that were around 5,000, 10,000 years ago. Now with galaxies, on the other hand, we have an enviable historical record, and that is to say the finite speed of light. So light travels, as we know, at a finite speed. So something a billion light years away when something's a billion light years away, we're seeing the light that was emitted from it a billion years ago. Or in the case of these galaxies here, they're about 13 billion year, light years away. So when we look at galaxies at that distance, we're actually seeing the state of the universe as it was 13 billion years ago, which is about a half billion years after the Big Bang, very early on. By looking at galaxy collections of galaxies, populations at different steps in time, we can then watch these things evolve again, on average, as populations with time. So we obviously can't say that red spiral on the right-hand side came from this blob over here on the left. Those are two different galaxies at two very different times. But we could say, on average, perhaps all of those red spirals, a thousand galaxies that look like that and have similar mass, came from galaxies that look maybe something like this over here. So that's the crux of galaxy evolution studies. What are, what are the commonalities between these things? What are the evolutionary links between the galaxy population? Um, if you looked at a diagram like this, you might notice that there are some spiral galaxies that are red and some that are blue. So you might naturally ask, what are the links between those? Did the red ones turn into the blue ones? Did the blue ones turn into the red ones? Similarly, there are some galaxies that are rather amorphous, they don't have many features compared to the spiral galaxies. But you might still guess that there's some relation between them. Maybe the spirals transformed into the ellipticals or the ellipticals into the spirals somehow. Now Hubble, when he originally came up with the tuning fork, actually thought it was from left to right, ellipticals going to spirals. But as you'll see shortly, we don't think that's the case anymore. Now studying galaxies, especially distant ones, presents us with a number of challenges. 
Um, this is a very important challenge that was measured, that was uh, presented in previous talks, which is that galaxies are actually insignificant. On a cosmic scale, they make up nothing. So what this pie chart shows is the mass energy budget of the universe. The vast majority, the purple area, is what we call dark energy. It's this mysterious force that we only see through the, its actions on galaxies in the universe, pushing things apart. So the universe as a whole is expanding, and dark energy is accelerating that expansion. It makes up most of the energy and mass in our universe. The second most common component is this green wedge, dark matter, making up about a quarter of the stuff in the universe. Dark matter acts like normal matter in that it behaves gravitationally, it pulls things in, but we can't see it. And that leaves us with this tiny little wedge in the end, on the right, atoms. So the atoms, the molecules that make up stars, galaxies, this building, you and I, make up only 5% of the total stuff in the universe. And it's worse than that, okay? Break up these atoms into galaxies and non-galaxies, it turns out the stuff in galaxies only makes up 7% of the atoms in the universe. 93% of the atoms are in the stuff between the galaxies, just these tenuous clouds of gas that extend over millions and billions, hundreds of billions, uh, tens of billions of light years. So that's kind of a problem. If you multiply those two numbers, 5% and 7%, you find that galaxies make up 0.3% of the total stuff in the universe. They're truly this insignificant component riding on the waves of dark matter and dark energy that make up most of the stuff out there. Everybody has their own analogy for how insignificant this is. I'm a fan of junk food, so I always say that if uh, the universe was a bag of chips, the galaxies would be the salt. So what we see when we look at these galaxy distributions out there is really the salt encrusted on these chips. It's, it's a tiny tracer. And there's another issue, if you, if you can believe that. Um, and that is that, except for the closest galaxies, we don't actually see individual stars. So you take an image like this from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, the stars and the galaxies are basically all smeared together. You see the total added together light of the stars in a galaxy, but you don't see the stars one by one. You just see these blobs. And of course, astronomy is a look but don't touch science. So you can't actually go up and poke and prod these galaxies and see what they're made of. You just have to look. So it's really analogous to trying to understand something about the people living in this Pasadena neighborhood from the light that they emit. <laughs> That's not altogether crazy. If you looked at this map, you might be able to surmise that there are more people living on the right half of the map than on the left half, because the people on the right half are emitting more light than the people on the left. And that would be correct, but you would be very mistaken to try and apply that law globally. This is a famous picture of the Korean Peninsula. So the population difference between these two countries is only a factor of two. Above the line, there are 24 million. Below the line, there are 48 million. But as you can see, there's a vast difference in the amount of light these populations emit per person. So these, all added together, sum up to quite a challenge for studies of galaxy evolution. However, we've persevered. And so in the last talk, this is Dr. Guillermo Blanc, my esteemed colleague, who talked about galaxies in their infancy. He took us back to the beginning of the universe, the beginning of time and space, to the quantum fluctuations right after the Big Bang, which gave rise to the first galaxies in the universe, the ones that were born about 13, point, uh, 13 billion years ago. So you can really think of this talk as sort of a where are they now talk. Where were these, what is, what's happened to these child stars in the past 13 billion years? <laughs> so the, the first section of this talk I'm calling an aging population. So we have to really understand what it means for a galaxy to age or get old, and what kinds of signifiers we can use, what physical characteristics of a galaxy change as it reaches the later stages of its life. <laughs> and to understand this, we really have to first get down to the molecular level of galaxies, that is, the stars themselves. So this is a picture of our closest neighbor, our closest large neighbor, I should say, the Andromeda, or M31 galaxy. You zoom in on this with the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can see the billions of stars. This is just an infinitesimally tiny fraction of this galaxy on the left. 
So billions and billions of stars add together to make the light that we see from galaxies. What are these stars? This is a graph showing star brightness versus star color. So it's uh, left to right is going blue to red, going uh, top to bottom is getting brighter. Most stars, most normal stars in the universe fall in what we call the main sequence. It's this diagonal line um, going from blue and bright stars down to red and uh, faint stars. And this is essentially, what this boils down to is it's really a mass sequence. So the position a star occupies on this diagram tells us how much mass it has, how much stuff is in the star. So you get stars like the sun, which are kind of in the middle. They're fairly typical stars. Um, they look kind of yellowish. Down in the lower right corner, stars that are about 10% of the sun's mass. And in the upper left, you can get to 10 to even 100 times the, the mass of the sun. Now, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the adage, the, uh, the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. That's not always true, obviously, because that depends on the amount of fuel you have to burn. So these two candles are burning about equally bright, but obviously one will burn much longer than the other. In fact, you can write out a, a simple mathematical equation for how long each one will burn. The lifetime is equal to the amount of fuel you have divided by how fast you're burning that fuel. Or equivalently, it's the mass of the candle, that is, how much stuff you have, divided by some proportionality of the candle's brightness or luminosity, because presumably if it's burning stuff faster, it'll be brighter. Now, how does this apply to stars? It turns out that the way the nuclear reactions that power stars work, for most stars out there, the luminosity goes as something like the fourth power of mass. So going back to that candle equation I wrote down previously, the lifetime is equal to mass over luminosity, which means it's roughly proportional to one over the cube of the mass. Now that's pretty incredible. What that tells you is that tiny changes in mass can have extreme effects on the, mass, uh, on, the, on the brightness and the lifetime of a star. Just as an example, a star with 10 times the mass of the sun burns 10,000 times brighter and only lives one one thousandth as long. So the sun has a lifetime, a predicted lifetime of about 10 billion years. A star that's 10 times the sun's mass burns out in 10 million years, which on cosmic time scales is just the blink of an eye. So when you, what you end up when you form stars is very bright, hot, blue stars that are very rare. So when you make stars, you don't make a lot of these extremely massive ones, and they only last a few to a few hundred million years. And conversely, you make a huge number of these faint, cool red stars. And these things last effectively forever. So things down at, stars down at a tenth of the, the sun's mass can live hundreds, even thousands of billions of years. And these things are made in spades. These things are uh, outweigh, the, in both number and mass, the total number of uh, blue things that are made in galaxies. So just as a uh, illustration of how this ultimately applies to galaxies, this is a picture of the tarantula, tarantula nebula in the Milky Way. This is a star-forming region. It's a big giant cloud of uh, gas and dust that is continually in different parts of the image collapsing and forming new generations of stars. Um, it's a very complex process, but just for simplicity, let's assume the whole thing collapses at once and makes a typical generation of stars. So, what do we have here? Right after the collapse, we have a few of these extremely bright blue stars. And just the way I've drawn them on purpose is so that they completely obliterate all of the light from the other stars. This galaxy, or rather this group of stars that was created, is completely dominated by these massive blue ones, but these don't last long. In 10 million years, they go supernova. They're gone. Now you're left with somewhat less massive, but still very bright stars. I've colored them green, even though they're probably still blue. Um, I know those are dominating the light, but again, after a few tens, hundreds, maybe hundreds of million years, maybe a billion years, they're gone as well. They go supernova. Now the red stars are starting to peek through. Now you're getting a, what we call an old stellar population at about a billion years. You have stars that are essentially sun-like, you know, around, around the mass of the sun and below. And over very long time scales, even these things flame out and you're left with just the red things, the red stars. 
So each progressive generation of star formation works the same way and deposits more of these red stars in a galaxy. So that's essentially what I mean by an old galaxy versus a young galaxy. Color acts as a chronometer. The young galaxies are dominated by these massive bright blue stars. As those die off, they leave behind the cooler yellowish red stars. So the color of a galaxy essentially tells us whether new stars are being formed in that galaxy. If it's blue, it is forming stars. If it's red, it's not, and it, hasn't, it probably hasn't in quite some time. Now, what happens if you go out with your telescopes and you observe a bunch of galaxies? You conduct a survey, you look at galaxies at a variety of distances and pick up large numbers of them so you can actually tell something about the populations. Well, first of all, I'm going to show this again. I know I've said it before, but it's important. There are red, red elliptical galaxies and blue spirals. There's not a lot of uh, the other way around, actually. There are very few blue ellipticals out there. So what that tells us is that ellipticals are essentially done forming stars. These blobby things on the left have made more or less all of the stars that they're going to make. They probably represent the end stages of a galaxy's evolution, um, the retirement phase, if you will. So if ellipticals can't form their own stars, it's likely that at least some of them come from spirals somehow. But there's another thing we also notice in our surveys. And that is, if you look back in time, if you look at the sequence of, if you look at the number of these spirals and ellipticals going uh, back billions of years, you see that the fractions change pretty dramatically. So you go back 10, 12 billion years, and most of the galaxies in the universe seem to be star forming. They're actively forming stars. As you go along, as you approach the present day, that ratio actually flips. You end up with a lot more of these non-star forming elliptical galaxies relative to the spirals. So a lot more stars are getting tied up in these galaxies that are no longer forming stars. This is another way to show that. Uh, don't bother with the details of this plot. What this shows is the, basically the cosmic sum of star formation, the number of stars being formed per billion years by the universe as a whole. And then on the uh, horizontal axis is time with the present day at the right and the Big Bang at the left. So the really important thing to pick up from this figure here is this 90% decrease in the star formation rate of the universe at late times. In other words, in the last seven billion years or so, the universe has stopped forming stars by 90%. So that's pretty profound. That tells us that we live in a evolving universe, which we knew from before, but uh, it's still quite interesting. The universe is not carrying on like it always has. There's actually been a dramatic change in the last half of cosmic time. So we have two problems to explain. We have an individual problem. What's causing these spirals to turn into elliptical galaxies? And we have a cosmic problem, a global problem. Why is it that the universe is slowing down at star formation? Why, isn't, why doesn't it just keep going the way it's always been going? To address the first question, we think we've caught some galaxies in the act of transformation, in the act of turning from spirals into ellipticals. And this goes back to the slideshow I was playing before the talk began which is merging galaxies. So close galaxy pairs like these are fairly common. We actually see them, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Arp found quite a few in his Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. And it's almost like you're looking at some kind of a stop motion ballet when you look at these, but with different characters each time. You see interactions between them, they're being distorted gravitationally. You see large tidal tails between them where stars are being stripped away. And ultimately, with some of them, you see them at a point where they look like they're in their final coalescence. So there are some tails of debris left over, but the individual galaxies have more or less become one. Now, each of these pictures, of course, is essentially frozen in time. The entire merging process, we think, takes about a billion years or more to complete. But with computers, we can now simulate what these would actually look like if you could see the whole thing. So this is a... Uh, movie by Carnegie fellow T.J. Cox. He actually gave a Huntington lecture last year, and I'm almost certain he showed this one, but it's so cool I have to show it again. So starting out, this is a uh, 
a spiral galaxy and another spiral galaxy approaching it. You see they both distort each other gravitationally. So there's a bunch of debris floating around. You can see this no longer looks like a nice ordered spiral. It looks fairly disturbed. I should also point out this uh, clock in the upper left is billions of years. So we're now at about one and a half billion years. Now this uh, second one is coming in again. Interacts again. And here, he freezes the movie, pulls it out, and there's a picture from a galaxy survey of an interacting pair. And then the merger carries on for another few hundred million years until you essentially have what looks like an elliptical formed from the original two spirals. And there's some debris left around this elliptical, which we actually see around some elliptical galaxies in the local universe. So these are images from what's called the Atlas 3D survey. It's just very long exposures taken of some nearby elliptical galaxies. So these things have completely more or less stopped their star formation. And you can see that all of them have these sort of distorted asymmetric shapes. Some of them have shells, some of them have remaining tails. So it looks like all of these galaxies here were formed at least partly through some kind of merging activity. So it looks, it looks like we have a lot of evidence now that, that mer uh, spiral mergers in the local universe do create elliptical galaxies. But now, why is it that that actually stops star formation? There's no reason, at least no obvious reason, why you should merge two, why you should merge two spiral galaxies together that are forming stars and the resulting galaxy wouldn't form stars. There has to be something else going on. So something else is something we call feedback. It's galaxies versus themselves. In a sense, the worst enemy of star formation is star formation. Or from the galaxy's perspective, this old Pogo quote might be a uh, relevant might be relevant. So let's go back to some of these pictures of galaxy mergers. What really stands out in the ones I've selected here, especially in the left two, leftmost galaxies, are these extremely bright blue knots of star formation. So you see these just glowing blue regions in, in each of these two galaxies on the left. And even on the right, those galaxies also seem to show enhanced star formation. There's more blue stars being formed in those than perhaps there would be in normal spiral galaxies. The reason for this goes back to these uh, star forming regions that I mentioned before. Stars are formed by the collapse, the gravitational collapse of clouds of gas and dust. And if you merge a couple of galaxies together, what you're doing is you're essentially stirring up the gas and dust in those galaxies. Sometimes you're compressing it and you're actually making it easier for that gas to collapse gravitationally. You're squishing it closer together and that lets gravity take over more easily. When you do that, you form more stars. When you form more stars, you form more of these things. And these things, remember, blow up. Now, blow up is kind of a uh, understatement. I mean, there's a, these are supernovae. There's a tremendous amount of energy released. It's basically a thermonuclear detonation that for at least a day or two can outshine all of, the other all of the other stars in the galaxy combined. So these release tremendous amounts of energy in both light and both en in a mechanical energy, just stuff being flung out to large distances at extremely high velocities. Now what happens if you have a whole bunch of those going off at once? You get something like this galaxy, which is M82. It's what we call a nuclear starburst galaxy. It has this intense burst of star formation happening in the center. And all of these blue stars are exploding and sending out these massive waves of stuff. Um, if, in case it's a bit hard to see here, that's the disk of the galaxy. So we're seeing a spiral galaxy essentially edge on. And the stuff indicated by the arrows is the outflow. So the red gas in that, arrows, uh, in that outflow is about 10,000 degrees, and the blue gas is about a million degrees. So the star formation in the center of this galaxy is violently ejecting the gas and dust and heating it up. And remember, you need gas and dust to form stars. So what this galaxy is basically doing is shutting itself down. It's throwing out all of its star formation material by the stars that are forming in its center. And by the way, I should also point out that M82 
recently underwent an interaction with M81. So these two galaxies pass close to each other. We think that M82 was torqued. The gas in M82 was basically disturbed and sent to the center of M82, which is causing, at least partly causing, that starburst in its center. So star formation can shut down star formation, paradox paradoxically enough. There's something else that we think might also be in play, and that is black holes. So observational evidence is now pretty strong that most massive galaxies in the nearby universe have supermassive black holes at their centers. So if a, ga uh, if a galaxy is, say, 100 billion times the mass of the sun, it might have a black hole in the center that's a, a bill, uh, uh, sorry, 100 billion times the mass of the sun, it might have a black hole in the center that's a billion times the mass of the sun. So these mergers, as I said, can drive gas to the center of galaxies, can compress it, and can cause it to form new stars, but the black holes take their share as well. So this is just an a, uh, artist's conception from the European Space Agency of what happens when gas gets close to a black hole. So a lot of people think of black holes as these things that swallow light and matter and never let it out, and that's kind of true. But black holes are incredibly messy eaters. In order to get down close enough to the black hole to be swallowed by it, this gas has to release an incredible amount of energy. It basically gets heated up to millions of degrees. We think that there may be things like powerful winds driven by magnetic fields and other phenomena near the black hole. So the area around the black hole, before you even get to it, is already an extreme environment. And it dumps out also an incredible amount of energy. So again, the uh, black hole, these accreting black holes, these active nuclei, we call them, can put out more energy than all the stars in a galaxy combined. So that's another potential candidate for feedback. It's possible that um, black holes cause similar feedback to supernovae. They can expel the gas from a galaxy and uh, cause it to not be able to form stars anymore. Now that's been somewhat speculative for a while. But I'm, a I'm actually going to show you some hot off the press's new results that seem to have some observational evidence for this. So this is a picture of the galaxy Markarian 231. This is one of those active galaxies that I mentioned. All of this fuzz that basically fills the frame here is the galaxy itself. That's the stars in the galaxy. This bright little pinpoint in the center, we think, is one of those accreting black holes. So one of those black holes that's drawing in gas and heating it up to incredible temperatures. And I should point out that entire region, that disk that I showed in the previous movie, uh, is infinitesimally small in this image. So it's, it's tiny compared to the rest of the galaxy. So what these researchers did is they went with a special instrument that's good at accurately measuring velocities of gas, precisely. So they went within, within this uh, white square shown here. And this is a picture from that instrument. So these, these are, again, just um, basically the stars in the galaxy near the center of the galaxy. And in each one of these squares in this image, in each one of these pixels, they were able to measure how fast gas is moving with this instrument. And this is a map of those speeds. So the velocities on the right are in kilometers per second. The green stuff in this map is moving at 900 kilometers every second. A kilometer is pretty big. 900 kilometers per second corresponds to about 2 million miles per hour. And the purple stuff in the upper right is moving even faster. It's something like 3, uh, 3 million miles an hour. So this is, these are incredible velocities. This is more than fast enough for this gas to escape the galaxy's gravitational pull. So there's still some verification to do on these results. Like I said, these are brand new. And people are just starting to come out with more and more discoveries like this. But if this is correct, then what we're witnessing is a galaxy actually blowing out its star-forming material on a large scale by the action of the black hole in its center. And this is some of the first evidence that we're, ac we're actually seeing this happening on a galaxy-wide scale. So just to summarize the picture I've put together so far, we think that spiral galaxies can merge together. We think that they may be able to expel their star-forming material 
due to either the activity of black holes or subsequent star formation. And we think that this process may ultimately end in elliptical galaxies, where the collision between the spiral galaxies has scrambled up their stellar structures. They no, no longer look ordered and spiral. And the feedback has blown out the gas and kept it from forming new stars. But this brings us back to our cosmic problem, our global issue, which is even though you have spiral galaxies transforming into these ellipticals, why is it that new spirals don't just pop up and basically replace the, uh, the star formation that's lost to the ellipticals? Why is the universe shutting down at star formation? It doesn't really make much sense from this plot. Again, there's only 7% of the gas out there is in galaxies. 93% of the gas is not in galaxies. Back around the time of the Big Bang, this pie chart looked like this. 100% of the stuff out there was not in galaxies because galaxies didn't exist. So over the past 13 or so billion years, there's been a transfer of stuff from outside of galaxies to inside of galaxies. Matter has been falling onto galaxies to help them form new stars. But for some reason, it's not transferring as fast. We're not getting as much new stuff falling onto galaxies. The reason behind this, we now think, is something that I'll call cosmic climate change. Or if you prefer cosmic warming. <laughs> so this is a picture from a computer simulation of this early intergalactic medium, this stuff between galaxies. Blue is hot, red is cold, and there's a galaxy in the middle. And this is about, I think, 12 billion years ago. So what we see here is this cold stuff moving along these nice, well-defined cold filaments onto the central galaxy, basically continually feeding hydrogen and helium into this galaxy, providing fuel for the galaxy to form new stars. But over the inter intervening uh, 12 giga years or so, we think that this is heated up. So this is now a simulation, a, a, a movie of this heating process happening. Again, blue is cold, yellow and red are hot. And you can see that as we go, uh, I should point out this is about 10 billion years ago here, um, and we're going ahead in time. So as we move closer and closer to the present day, these models predict that this intergalactic gas is actually heated up to millions or tens of millions of degrees. And the vast majority of it is heated up like that. And this is all from a variety of processes, basically gas falling onto the filaments and getting shocked or heated by friction or by uh, the vast array of black holes and stars are already forming in the universe um, can be irradiating it. So this intergalactic gas is heated up. Why is that a problem? Um, to put it simply, it's because gas, when it gets heated up, expands. So the atoms in the gas become more energetic, they speed up and they move farther apart and it becomes ex exponentially more difficult for gravity to overcome the, uh, the gas when it's expanded like this um, when it covers a greater distance. The gravitational pull can't draw it back in and cause it to form new stars and compress it to the scales that you need to form new stars. So essentially before you have these nice cool filaments feeding gas into galaxies and allowing them to form large numbers of stars. Now that gas is tenuous, puffed up, and it can't efficiently feed star formation in galaxies. And just on a personal side note, this uh, stuff is rather close to my heart because I did my PhD thesis on it. Um, this has been predicted by theory, but we spent a lot of time trying to confirm it observationally. Um, people do look at you kind of funny when you tell them that your thesis was based on hot air. <laughs> and it was also the source of my first mention in the media. This is the tabloid indiadaily.com. <laughs> the title of the article is Aliens Rush to Parallel Universe as a Sizable Chunk of the Missing Invisible Universe Floating in Super Hot Rivers of Gas Threatened to Destroy Galaxies. <laughs> Scientists and astronomers are getting early indications that the advanced alien civilizations may have left the physical universe and shifted to the parallel universe. <laughs> so now that I have this public forum, I'd like to clear a few things up. <laughs> First of all, we think the aliens are probably staying put. They're not going anywhere. Second, these gas rivers won't destroy galaxies. They'll just keep them from forming new stars. 
And finally, astronomers are scientists. There's no need to break them apart <laughs> into two categories. <laughs> so going back to my original slide and the triptych I put up there, it looks like we can actually start to draw arrows now between these three um, stages of a galaxy's golden years. Going back to the anthropological analogies, it seems that spiral galaxies, like some cities, tend to grow piecemeal and gradually. And over billions of years, the stars in them are born, they live out their lives, and some of them ultimately die out. Galaxies can also grow dramatically and suddenly through mergers. They can undergo rapid changes where galaxies that were once independent and living by themselves merge together and become difficult to distinguish, like the cities of the Inland Empire. Though this isn't a perfect analogy, because obviously these cities don't fall into each other. They just look like they do. But on a cosmic scale, it looks like the vast reservoirs of gas that once fed the birth of new stars have become hot and tenuous. So in terms of star formation, the universe and the galaxies in it are well into what appears to be an inexorable decline. Nonetheless, most of the stars and galaxies still have tens of billions of years left. The galaxies themselves carry on. And I hope I've convinced you that even those galaxies which have reached the end of their star forming years still leave, lead very active and interesting lives. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I'm sure we have some questions. This gentleman right here. The, uh, the upgraded Hubble telescope, uh, will it uh, do another uh, better ultra deep field photograph to upgrade? Yeah, the question is, will the upgraded Hubble Space Telescope do another ultra deep photograph? Um, and the answer it is, is it's doing that right now. Um, there are some very large extragalactic survey projects to basically stare at uh, very deep fields, uh, to stare at some of the deep fields that were previously done, but much deeper, and at new wavelengths that Hubble can now observe efficiently. So yeah, we're going to... What's the results? What are the results? What are the results? Um, when will the results be? Oh, when will the results? Uh, some of them are already coming out. So they're actually... Um, I mean, the big advance is now that they can observe galaxies in the infrared in large numbers with Hubble. And what infrared light gets us is galaxies that are extremely far away where their basically visible light has been Doppler shifted to the infrared part of the spectrum. So, yeah, I mean, there, there are results coming out now, and I think there's going to be a flood in the next year. Why is so much of the movement spiral or circular rather than uh, It's just... Um, oh, sorry. Well, why, why is so much of the movement in spiral galaxies spiral or circular rather than linear? Um, the answer is what we call conservation of angular momentum. So basically, if something is spinning, if you have something really big that's spinning, even a little tiny bit, and it collapses to form a galaxy, it ends up rotating around whatever axis it was originally spinning around. Um, so basically, you end up with these pancakes that form into these spiral galaxies, these, these spiral disks, and then the stuff that's... Uh, the, the rotation is just due to the orbits of all the stars and the gas going around the, the uh, mass interior to them. Way in the back. Do you anticipate any kind of oscillation where the gas is heated up that is now being cool and perhaps it could explode the velocity? Uh, we don't think so. And I think part of the reason for that might be this dark energy that I mentioned before, this acceleration of the cosmos. So these filaments of gas are so vast that they actually don't really interact gravitationally with themselves at all, or only very weakly. They're just too big to actually feel the, the pull of gravity from, uh, from their far reaches. So what happens to things that aren't gravitationally held together when the universe's expansion starts accelerating is they just get pulled farther and farther apart. So I, I think what's going to happen with these, these gas filaments is they're essentially going to become more and more tenuous as the universe universe's expansion speeds up, um, and they'll be correspondingly less able to collapse onto galaxies and form new stars. Can you talk a little bit about the impending merger of Andromeda and Neutral? <laughs> 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 yeah.
yeah, it's, it's coming up. Um, <laughs> it's going to be pretty cool. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know the exact time scale. It's supposed to happen in, I think, less than a billion years. Or less than a billion years. Um, and actually, people have made movies of this. So they've, they've made uh, predicted movies of what it will look like from, say, the perspective of the sun when we merge with Andromeda. We're probably not going to collide with any other stars, if that's what you're worried about. But um, yeah, I mean, presumably, we'll end up with something that looks like one of these merger remnants, one of these more elliptical or you know, at least less spirally galaxies once the Milky Way and Andromeda merge together. Uh, well, the Milky Way, I mean, as I mentioned with my analogy with the, uh, let's see. Oh, so you mean the uh, morpho, so he's wondering about the evolution or the morphology of the Milky Way itself. Um, yeah, there's some debate on whether it has a bar. But as far as star formation is concerned, it's, it's just basically puttering along right now. It's making stars at a more or less constant rate. When it collides with Andromeda, though, there are going to be fireworks. So. Uh, so the question is, if I understand, um, when you have this gas cooling onto galaxies at a certain rate and forming new stars, can you place limits on the amount of dark matter that's going along with the gas? The fact that the gas which has been expelled doesn't have much gravitational, doesn't have much cooling. Does that tell you something about the limit of dark matter gravitational action? Um, I'm not actually sure. I mean, presumably, when gas gets expelled from a galaxy, it doesn't contain much dark matter because the dark matter doesn't interact with whatever's expelling the gas. So you, but it would uh, be drawn back into the galaxy, say, under the influence of dark matter. If uh, elliptical galaxies are, on the average, older than spirals, uh, wouldn't you expect that the metal content, heavy element content, is greater in that elliptical galaxy than the spiral? Um, yeah, the question is, since the um, elliptical galaxies are older than spirals, would you expect the metal content to be greater? Um, yes, but it depends on what metal content you're talking about. If it's the metal locked up in old stars, then, uh, then that would be true, because these successive generations of supernovae form, um, form, form metals. They basically, that's where metals that, and heavy elements that make up all of us come from. Um, if you're talking about the, the uh, metallicity of the gas between the stars, you might get a different answer. But I think generally that's, that's true. The ellipticals do have higher metallicity. Well, let's do, we'll just do one more question and then go ahead. Um, does the decline categorically be an extension of the rate of the Uh, the question is, does the decline have anything to do with expansion? I suppose you mean the expansion of the universe? Um, yeah, it could. I mean, as I mentioned before, you have the universe um, expanding. These filaments of gas are stretching apart, so it becomes naturally a bit more um, difficult just due to the larger distances involved for them to fall onto galaxies. Um, but I think the major factor is just the heating of it. The fact that it's being heated up to millions of degrees um, you know, puffs it out and makes it actually really hard for it to cool and form new stars. Um, I'm sh so we're going to stop it there. Rick will be happy to answer more questions. Feel free to come up. I'll remind you, if you are not on the Carnegie mailing list, please sign up on the way out so we can, you can find us next year, wherever we're at. Thanks again for coming. <laughs>